What's Your FTP has basically become the cycling equivalent of what do you bench for gym bros? Hit any serious cycling group ride and this question is going to be thrown around quite a bit. And the numbers that you get in response are going to range from a bit inflated to blatantly exaggerated. And notice how in both these cases the answer that the person gave you is higher than their actual FTP. That wasn't an accident. FTP is supposed to be the highest power number that you can sustain for one hour, which is supposed to coincide with the power at which your blood lactate starts to spike and fatigue will set in much more rapidly. Therefore, the higher someone's FTP, the stronger they are. Simple. However, it is possible that there are issues with both these assertions, and I'll get into that in a minute. But perhaps the biggest issue is that all of this is done in a fresh state, which is where the concept of durability comes in. Stick around to find out what durability is, how to train it, and why it's so important. I would argue even more so than your FTP. Welcome back to the channel. This video is fueled by the feed. Before we get into durability, I want to discuss the current gold standard of dick measuring in cycling, which is FTP. There are a number of different ways to test your FTP, but perhaps the most common is to ride for 20 minutes as hard as you can, and then take 95% of your average power from that effort to get the number that you could hypothetically hold for 60 minutes, which is hypothetically where your power at lactate threshold lies. That's two assumptions that have to be made in order for the 20 minute test to be accurate, and fortunately we have research on both of them. This study looked at whether or not the 20 minute test actually predicted the maximum lactate steady state by having subjects do the 20 minute test and taking the subject's blood lactate during a ramp test. As it turns out, taking 95% of a 20 minute test overestimated the power at maximum lactate steady state by about 7%. When the subjects returned seven months later to get tested again, their maximum lactate steady state had increased, but their 20 minute power had not, indicating the two should not be used interchangeably. It also seems that 20 minute power may just overestimate 60 minute power in general, which may be the source of the discrepancy. Depending on the method used, this study would have predicted a 60 minute power with a 20 minute test in the mid 320s, while the actual tested 60 minute power was 309. These are just two studies though, and when we look at the balance of evidence, eh, it's hard to come to a clear conclusion. And disagreement between studies seems to be the theme here, with some finding that 20 minute power does predict power at LT, while others finding that it does not. This is the point at which people will start asking about their own personal favorite FTP tests like various ramp tests or the two by eight method or the method where you don't test anything at all but you just have a feeling that it's around this number because of what you've been doing in training recently, which is actually fairly common amongst pros, if I'm being honest. Dude, how many times I gotta tell you? Whatever you tell me your FTP is, add 10 watts, that's what mine is. Most accurate FTP equation in existence. We could spend all day assessing various FTP testing methods, and maybe I will in a future video, but the point that I'm getting at is that at the end of the day, they're all just estimates and they're not perfect. But that doesn't mean they're useless because they are a point of comparison for yourself and against others. Theoretically, if your FTP is higher than someone else's or even higher than your past self, then you should be stronger and you should perform better in a race. Or should you? I think every serious cyclist has the experience of beating somebody with a higher FTP or getting beaten by somebody with a lower FTP. Now at this point, this video could easily turn into me talking about all the things that affect race outcomes that aren't FTP, and there is a long list, obviously. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm still talking purely about power numbers and one rider being stronger than another when the race is won and lost. And that last part is key. Races are not won and lost at the beginning with fresh legs. Mm, I think MVDP would beg to differ. He's gonna lead them out from Dakota. Look at the speed he takes down there. They're won at the end with tired legs. And this is where the concept of durability comes into play. Durability has been getting a lot of attention in pro cycling recently and for good reason. A rider's durability may be the most important determining factor of how they finish in a race, even more so than their FTP. This review article on the topic defines durability as the time of onset and magnitude 
magnitude of deterioration in physiological profiling characteristics over time during prolonged exercise. Or in plain English, that would translate to how does a rider perform when they are fatigued? Let me give you an example so that we can see how this would play out in the real world. Let's take two riders who are both the same weight. Rider A has an FTP of 350 watts, and Rider B has an FTP of 330 watts. With fresh legs, there really won't be a competition. Up a 20 minute climb, Rider A is gonna take it. But let's say Rider A has very bad durability, and Rider B has very good durability. After four hours of racing, both riders approach the final climb to the finish, and Rider A's 60 minute power has dropped by 20%, putting them at 280 watts. Rider B's 60 minute power has only dropped by 5% after all this riding, which puts them at 313 watts. Oof, yeah, it looks like Rider B is taking this one. The second scenario that I laid out where there was four hours of racing before a race winning move needed to be made is a much more typical race scenario in the real world, hence why durability is receiving so much attention. Durability could also refer to one's ability to hold a steady power output for long periods of time. It doesn't have to be a specific effort made after riding a long time. It is essentially just referring to one's ability to resist fatigue over prolonged bouts of exercise. And research is showing that it's durability that determines success in actual races, not a rider's fresh power numbers. For example, this study looked at power data from 112 professional cyclists from both the pro team and the world tour. Interestingly, despite the world tour riders getting much better results than the pro team riders, there was no consistent differences found between the two groups in mean maximal power output in a non-fatigued state. What this means is that despite world tour riders getting all the results, if you were to actually look at their fresh power numbers versus the lower level riders, you would be hard pressed to find much of a difference. The real difference came when assessing these riders in a fatigued state. The lower level riders showed a greater decay in MMP compared to the world tour riders after fatigue, and the more fatigue that was accumulated, the greater the difference. This isn't the only study coming to this conclusion. This study found the same thing for both climbers and sprinters. Successful climbers showed less decline in 20 minute and five minute power, and successful sprinters showed less decline in 10 second and one minute power compared to their less successful counterparts. There are a number of reasons for why this occurs, but this study finds a rider's first ventilatory threshold often thought of as the top of someone's zone two in group ride speak actually decreases with fatigue due to decreased efficiency and rates of metabolic expenditure. What this means is that while a fresh value like your 20 minute power or your FTP may be useful to know, it may not be as good a predictor of race form as we once thought. And we should also keep in mind that certain metrics such as your lactate threshold are not static they change throughout a ride or race as you fatigue. This is something that we often see in younger versus older cyclists. While not always the case, younger cyclists often don't have as much total training time in their legs, which means they haven't developed a high durability yet. We have research to demonstrate this, and some studies even go as far as to say that durability may be the metric to look at to determine whether or not a U23 rider is ready for the pro ranks. It's not uncommon to see a talented junior post a 20 minute power value that rivals that of some successful pros, especially if you look at watts per kilo, because oftentimes these riders are very light. But the reason why they wouldn't perform well in a pro race is because they haven't developed durability yet. And whether or not they can develop durability by the time they hit their 20s may determine whether or not they are actually successful. All right, at this point, you may be on board with the concept of durability and how it's more important than FTP, but how do we measure it? After all, it would be an important metric to know to compare against your past self and against others. And you know, I need something to brag about on the group ride like we currently do with FTP. Well, while we don't have a standard test for durability, much like we don't have a standard test for FTP, which creates all sorts of issues, but I digress, 
there have been some methods that have been suggested, such as testing after a certain amount of work done. For example, doing a 20 minute test after doing say 2000 or 3000 kilojoules of work to see how that compares to your fresh 20 minute power. There are some potential issues here though. The biggest and most obvious is that you can get to 2000 kilojoules of work in different ways and it doesn't appear that they're all equal. For example, this study on prior accumulated work and intensity on power output had cyclists perform two 12 minute field tests. One was following a continuous moderate intensity effort and one was following high intensity intervals. It probably doesn't take a genius to predict that the power in the 12 minute test dropped more after doing the high intensity intervals by an average of 14 watts. Now this study does have a glaring problem and that is that in both tests the subjects rode for 150 minutes, meaning that subjects did accumulate more work in the high intensity condition. What would have been far more interesting is to match the amount of work done but change the way that you get there. For example, have subjects ride for longer at zone two and then ride for shorter but with higher intensity. I think this is very important to consider though. For a well-trained cyclist, riding for hours on end at zone two and then having to do a five minute or 20 minute test, really not that big a deal. But doing exhaustive VO2 max intervals and then having to do a 20 minute test, uh, yeah, that changes things entirely. The point I'm making is that not all 2000 kilojoule efforts are created equally, so it can be hard to standardize a protocol. Looking at metrics like heart rate drift over the course of a long ride may help you assess durability, although I would also argue that heat and hydration status could confound that. If you're really set on assessing your own durability, then I would standardize a protocol for you that you come back to time and time again such as riding at zone two until you hit 2000 kilojoules of work done and then doing a 20 minute test. I would argue that this number will give you a better idea of how prepared you are for a race than your fresh 20 minute power does. Unless the only kind of racing you do is chasing Strava segments. Hold on, what? This won't help me get more KOMs? Why didn't you say that at the beginning of the video? I would have paid even less attention than I already did. All right, we've discussed why durability is important and we've discussed various ways that you could test it despite some shortcomings and lack of standardization. But how do you actually go about training it? Truthfully, this is something that researchers are still investigating, but that doesn't mean that we don't have some good idea. This study on training characteristics and durability looked at data from 30 U23 riders across a season. More training time in zone two was associated with a higher two minute max power after fatigue and a more polarized training distribution produced a higher fatigued 12 minute power. One of the takeaways from the study was that polarized training is associated with an improvement in the fatigued power profile. And as mentioned earlier, age and more specifically training age, so for how many years a person has been training, seem to play a large role in a rider's durability. When it comes to durability, there is likely not one magic bullet workout that will get you where you need to be. This may not be the answer that you want to hear, but it may simply come down to doing the right training, doing a lot of it, and doing it for years on end. Durability is not something that is developed overnight, and it is likely the case that within reason, higher training volumes, more time at zone two extrapolated over years is the secret to performing well while fatigued. That being said, that doesn't mean you can't design a workout that specifically targets durability. Many coaches, including myself, do this to eke out every last percent from an athlete in the lead up to a big race. And the classic way to do this is by doing intervals in a fatigued state. Most of the time, you'll want to do your intervals with fresh legs to maximize the workout. This is pretty common advice and is generally a good idea. Occasionally though, I will include a race specific interval session where some or all of the intervals are done under fatigue. You can do this with many types of intervals ranging from tempo to 30-30s, etc. 
But as an example, let's look at a typical VO2 max workout, which might contain five five minute efforts at 105 to 120% of FTP with five minutes of recovery in between. If you wanted to tweak this workout to specifically target durability, what you might do is have three of the five minute efforts done at the beginning of the ride and then ride for another two or three hours before finishing up with the last two efforts at the end of the ride. It's important to note here that repeatability and durability are not necessarily the same thing. The first version of the workout targets repeatability more, which is the ability to repeat efforts over and over again in relatively quick succession. Durability is the ability to do efforts under fatigue, which is targeted more by the second workout. Yes, you could argue that the intervals done towards the end of the first workout are done in a state of fatigue, but it's not to the same extent as the second. Admittedly, this distinction between repeatability and durability is small, but in order to demonstrate why it's important, I want to reference this study done on pro cyclists racing the Vuelta. These riders were assessed for both durability and repeatability. When data from the race was analyzed, the more successful World Tour riders showed less decay in maximal power output as the race fatigue set in, as compared with the less successful pro team riders. On the other hand, no differences were seen between groups in repeatability throughout the race, suggesting that durability and not repeatability is a more relevant performance indicator. Before we wrap up how to improve durability with training, I want to discuss gym work. Yes, I am getting back on my high horse for the hundredth time on this channel about why cyclists should be strength training. That's probably not even an exaggeration. It's a Dylan Johnson video. We could make a drinking game out of how many times you get up on your high horse, bro. It is at this point that I'd like to remind you that the benefits of weight training to cycling performance are likely due to delayed activation of less efficient type two fibers, improved neuromuscular efficiency, conversion of fast twitch type two X fibers into more fatigue resistant type two A fibers, or improved muscular tenderness stiffness. Being able to save your type 2 fibers for late in the race or having more fatigue resistant type 2A fibers will delay fatigue and improve durability. So you can add that to the long list of reasons why cyclists should be weight training. I'm not gonna get into how to do that here, but I will leave links to videos I've done in the past about how and why cyclists should be lifting down in the description. And finally, this wouldn't be a video about durability without discussing perhaps the biggest improvement in endurance sports performance in the last five years, which specifically improves durability, which is nutrition. If hearing that improving your durability through training might take years was bad news for you, then this should be good news because fixing what you eat on the bike is much quicker. In short, riders are consuming vastly more carbohydrates while racing and training than they ever have. This is partially due to the greater awareness about how important carb intake is to performance and the refinement of modern fueling products that have different forms of carbohydrate in the right ratios to maximize gut absorption as much as possible. Even five years ago, 50 to 60 grams of carbs an hour was pretty common, and today that has ballooned to 90 or more grams of carbs an hour. Bike racing has become more of a sugar eating contest than your kid's birthday party. There are some athletes that even brag about hitting carb intakes close to 200 grams an hour. Now, I don't necessarily recommend that, but I would say that 90 to 100 grams of carbs per hour is a good goal to shoot for for most people, and this is done by practicing this on training rides to train the gut to handle it, and by using nutrition products that have the optimal ratio of maltodextrin to fructose to maximize absorption. Most endurance sports nutrition companies are on board with this at this point, but in case you're curious, I have left links to some of my favorites down in the description below. What this will do for you is it will increase the amount of energy available to you in the form of glucose, especially late into the race, vastly improving durability. This really is one of the main reasons why you are seeing records being smashed at the Tour and other pro races. People will always throw around cycling's dirty history, and I'm not saying that's outside of the realm of possibility, but our understanding of how to fuel has improved dramatically, and the effect that it's having is massive, especially on a metric that arguably matters the most, like 
durability. Thanks for watching. If you are looking to get faster, then I have links to Coaching Through Ignition Coach Co. and my own personal training plans on Training Peaks linked in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like, subscribe, and share it with your cycling friends. I'll see you in the next one.